Okay, why did Big Meech have such a long run at such a large scale? Why did nobody tell on him? Why did nobody... Nothing went wrong for a long time and he's still loved and admired. Well, it seems like even while he was enjoying spending millions of dollars a month, he was still willing to risk his freedom to make sure his guy stayed free when unexpected things happened. 38-year-old Anthony Jones was dead, and also 38-year-old Lamont Gurdy later died at Grady Hospital. The night that Riz and Wolf were killed in Buckhead, that was day 22 of going out every single night, two or three joints, every single night. We was all bosses because everyone, everybody ran their own situation. From the outside looking in, you would see one man and a crew because that's how your average drug organization or drug crew is is laid out or depicted. It's the nigga who gets the plug and then he sells it to his friends and there it is. Well, your average drug crews are citywide. We were nationwide, which means that each individual had more control than what you would do in your city. So therefore, I could run a state. Oh, you might not come in until seven, eight, right? But we get up around 12, 1, you know, I'd start running around, I'd leave the house, start moving around with my magazines. Uh, around 7, 7.30, uh, he would call me and say, uh, uh, come on to the house, I mean, we, you know, we starting to get ready. This is now preparing to go out. So, you know, every day was a trip to the mall, get new outfits, for, not that they were needed, just, you know, nothing else to do. So, you know, get the outfits and come back and everybody's in the house getting dressed and all that whatever and the music's playing we used, we used to call the house club kitchen because we came into the garage and right into the kitchen and the music's playing and we playing Jeezy new sh the big bag of smoke and you know wheels everywhere you know pills I mean without going into detail whatever he's still having to make money oh he is still the, the machine is running like you know a Swiss watch. It's just a lot was going on behind the party, bro. Because everywhere we go, we're on on this lift. Because that's how Atlanta is set up. We're on this lift, you know, and everybody's like looking up and you know, but it's going on. Cats are coming through and sitting down and chilling out and whispering in the air and whispering in the air, and whatever, whatever. It was no base. Because we moved from everywhere. We'd stay here three months. We'd stay there four months. We'd stay over here six months. There was no base. It was, where do you feel like being right now? Like, hey, let's go. Let's go here for a while. Let's lay right here. Or let's go lay our head over here for a while. But on the outside looking in, it's, oh, they're always here partying. No, this is just the most comfortable, beautiful place to party. Why not come here? It's relaxed. It's laid back. The party scene is beautiful. So... What better place to go and show your ass and spend that money than Atlanta? So your mind state from the outside looking in is this is their base. This wasn't no base. This is where we came to party at. We were running ragged though. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, they popping pills. They, they drinking, you know, we drinking Quervo. We doing, we doing shots with Quervo. Every, every, you know, every 10 minutes doing shots with Quervo. But on average, it's 30 of us, 40 of us sometimes, 50 of us sometimes. And everybody's got a bottle of champagne because he walks in the building and he buys every bottle of champagne they got. He doesn't care what it is, he buys every bottle. Every time we went to a club, he said, how many bottles of champagne you got? I want them all. So sometimes we stand there, and each one of us got two bottles of champagne. So you're drinking all the champagne, you're smoking all those weeds, 12 blunts going around. We don't leave the house until 1.30 in the morning. He getting his hair fresh and braided, you know what I'm saying, whatever. You know, we, we only leave the house until 1.30 in the morning. We saw going to the clubs. And it's two, three clubs. Hoods is 10 packs, 20 packs, 30 packs. We hundreds, two hundreds, a thousand. So I'm beyond a worker. I'm a boss. How am I not a boss? In a single night, right? Um... So this particular night, we come in uh, this morning, and uh, 
it's like we were running ragged. And, and I knew, I said, I know that this is getting to the point where it's going to be volatile and dangerous because of the simple fact that I'm feeling volatile and I'm the most mature and responsible person here. I was like, yo, bro, we are about a night away from something really happening, right? We, I said, look at Bull. Bull happened to walk by. I said, look at Bull. Bull got the smoothest skin of all, man. It's Bull, break the fuck out, bro. <laughs> Just stay in. Don't go nowhere. I got to meet with T.I. tonight. You know what I mean? I'm um, going to Patchwork, meet with him. We're going to shoot over to Magic City. And when we leave Magic City, I'm going to grab a couple of ladies, whatever, bring them on over. We're going to you know, hang out and kick or whatever. Don't leave, you know, don't go out. He said, all right, homie, we're going to chill out. We ain't going nowhere. We're going to wait for you to come. 38-year-old Anthony Jones was dead. And also, 38-year-old Lamont Gertie later died at Grady Hospital. So I'm in Magic City with T.I. Uh, I'm here. T.I.'s here. Tiny's getting a dance and Wolf is standing about four feet away from us. Wolf gets on his phone, looks at the phone, goes jetting out the door. So about an hour later, I go to the, um, the diner. The house is right around the corner. I stopped there, I said, yo, uh, I call, I said, I'm trying to see if somebody wants some food before I come in. So I'm sitting at the counter waiting for the food and I'm looking up at the televisions they got up there and I, and I see, you know, the cops, the scene, whatever, and it said, two, two men are killed in Buckhead. I was like, oh, shit, motherfucker, kill him. I said, I am so glad that my family is not out because that would definitely get blamed on BMF. Because I think they're in the house. Demetrius Flanori was identified by a witness and a warrant was secured for his arrest. Like, you would look at us like, oh, they sold drugs. They were, they were drug dealers. And the first thing that comes to mind is the bad things that, that are depicted of a, a drug dealer. And I think a lot of people met the other side of us before they met what people would say is the drug dealer. Once you met the drug dealer, it was nothing but negativity from there. But before you met the drug dealer, it was just a group of good men. I started getting calls around eight o'clock in the morning from everywhere. Yo, you all right? Yo, you all right? Yo, you all right? My man Big D from Queens said, yo, you okay? I heard about that shit. I said, what you talking about? He said, you man, that shit happened? Like and I'm like, holy shit. The only thing I'm thinking about is that I said, no, man, that did not happen. So um, a homie of ours pulls up, schoolboy. He pulls up and he's like, yo, yo, you got to help me, help me clean, clean the house up. So he starts gathering up all the you know, paraphernalia, weapons, you know, mostly just, just, you know, guns and shit, right? I start picking up all the discarded cell phones, you know? Because, you know, I put this shit in Don Diva magazine with all these little things are that are done that people don't think about that get them jammed up. I'm like, get all the phones, and there's phones everywhere. Phones that, that aren't being used no more, they burnt out, whatever, whatever, but they're still there, right? So I grab all the phones, grab the joints, we roll out. Um, Blue calls me, yo, homie, big homie, what to do? I don't know what to do. I said, well, since there's no telling what's happening, I said, I already got the call. This nigga's on the highway on their way here, okay? And so- From New York. Yeah. Because the beef could be out. Right, so don't, I said, definitely don't go out until we find out what the fuck is going on, you know? Uh, now, Meech got grabbed because he got hit and he's in, he went to the hospital and they found out who he was and they, they, had, they had them arrest him. What did Meech do? Well, Meech, he was shot, man. He was shot in the buttocks. Meech turns himself in. I don't know what he told him, but he might have said he did it out of self-defense or he didn't know what happened. I'm not sure what the statement was, but there was no powder barns on his hand. Bull had powder barns, but Bull didn't make a statement. Wolf was Puff's um, bodyguard and, you know, um, security, personal security, whatever, whatever. And, uh, you know, Wolf was a guy that was known and regarded, revered uh, by a lot of people. And... Um, that reverence, he leveraged that reverence to help him get access to the opportunity with working with Puff and also leveraged it to help Puff to circumvent certain situations, you know, uh, that would have been impediments for him, you know, had he not had somebody strong with him, right? Um, and of course, you know, all the things that happened, you know, with 
Suge's friend and you know supposedly Wolf having to have something to do with Suge's friend dying and all that whatever and that's what gave birth to that whole thing about Suge having an issue with uh, Wolf Jones was a guy that was at the center of quite a few iconic events. Some say he fronted a chunk of the money to Diddy to start a bad boy records. Many people say he's the guy who murked Big Jake Robles outside of yet another <laughs> club in Atlanta. Of course, Big Jake was the Captain Pie Rule that was down with Suge Knight, and that was the incident that really put bad boy and puffy and chewing it odds. Flannery's parents were in court. They wouldn't comment as they left the jail, but his defense attorney insists his client is no killer. I have somebody that's been shot and, and has been the victim of aggravated assault. I mean, you know, he received a serious gunshot wound. He's locked up or whatever, whatever. There's no evidence that, you know, there's, there's no evidence he shot, they tested him, and there's no evidence he shot a gun. They just locked him up because he was him, you know. Meach. Went in there, but means guys running through a million dollars living life, and whoever shot them, don't think it was me because he didn't have any powder barns, did a risky thing for himself by kind of putting himself in it, but he didn't have to, so that they would charge him and then they'd have to drop it and the case would be all messed up. And, uh, you know, his man Bull. Came up on it that smooth and easy. So Terry's home. Meach's probably gonna be home soon. Bull, he didn't. Uh, Bull went away for some other charge. I got a long interview with Bull. You can watch. And that's when he knew that he, you know, was on Front Street. When he put his name in the paper and all that, whatever, whatever. And he knew he was on Front Street then. After that, the bowling went to the next level. He was on house arrest for like six weeks or some shit like that. And when he got out, he bought himself the first Bentley GT to hit the street and the, and the first Phantom uh, to hit the street at the same time. Black, both of them. That's the tale of how Big Meech sort of took a charge for somebody, maybe for Bull. Our property